Hi guys, Anthony here. Hope everyone is doing well and have had a great week so far. Uh, following on from the forecast beating US non-farm payrolls data last night, we've had Chinese official services PMI come in overnight, its highest reading since 2010. So general feeling and sentiment in the market is still relatively positive, at least if you're looking at the equity market. But because the big question is how long can this last and will it do so in fact as we go into this extended long holiday for the weekend for Independence Day in the US with the COVID cases, the national wide numbers now above 50,000 again for the second day in a row. Um, remember to follow me on Twitter, my handle here, and you can see the account here. Uh, I'll be publishing my regular fundamental look ahead, my macro menu for the week ahead on Sunday. So if you want to read that and get prepared for the forthcoming week ahead, some of the key things that I'm looking at and my view on how the week might play out, then that will be available there. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We've got a fresh video coming from Eddie and his video from last weekend on Wirecard has had nearly 40,000 views now. So absolutely, he's putting out some great content at the minute. And then Sam will be putting out his regular technical analysis report uh, on Sunday as well. So don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, but let's have a look at the charts this morning and, uh, and just how things are playing out. And don't forget, of course, in North America, the Americans are out of the market today. So there is electronic trade. So if you're trading, um, things like oil or US indice futures, then they're going to trade all the way up to around 6 p.m. I think it is London time, um, but there's no cash trade. So uh, COMEX and NYSE, these sorts of floor trade is shut. Uh, so don't be looking for any type of pickup in volumes. Uh, and actually, when we look at the calendar for later on today, there's not a great deal coming out at all. So do take that under consideration when approaching a day like this. Um, therefore, I would be going through a fresh, marking up your charts from a technical perspective. It might well be that the market responds to those technicals quite well in a day which is going to really lack volume and any fundamental fixed catalysts. Um, that's not to say we still got to keep an eye out on the news if there's anything coming out and certainly things like COVID updates, the trade war, things of this nature, we will still remain alert too. But having a look here, uh, the DAX just knocking on the door on the center left chart here of where we were trading just shortly after the US uh, equity opened yesterday. So the DAX future at session highs as we speak, and that's just being seen here across the board now. You can see the green flashing on my charts, NASDAQ, S&P at their highs. Um, so just keeping an eye on close proximity to those levels that were seen shortly after payrolls yesterday. I uh, did see a little bit of, uh, I guess, kind of profit taking, closing out those long positions going into the close yesterday. Uh, but here we are again, we're not too far from, from those levels. So gold just edging a little lower uh, as equities just bumping up a bit as Europe has come in. So um, the yellow metal down about six bucks. Um, T notes fairly flat in the overnight session, uh, quite seesaw price activity actually yesterday. Um, and we're up about two ticks there. Oil. Uh, down 32 cents, just holding around a $40 handle. And in the FX markets, the Dixie's relatively flat. Um, we're down about one tenth. So the major pair is just reflecting. It's very moderate gains this morning at the open. Um, so quick run through of the headlines. China's services PMI came in at 58.4 uh, in June. I mean, that's a, that's a significant leap from 55 seen in the prior month and does in fact mean that this reading is now at its highest level since April uh, of 2010. So if you remember, this came after as well. Not quite as strong a number, but still in the expansionary territory. I think it was for the second month in a row we had for the manufacturing number just a few days ago. So some of these numbers in China continuing to uh, suggest a, a strong, at this point, economic recovery. And I was, I was looking at a number of charts this morning and it was looking at the from a data point of view you know nearly every economy around the world has had this v-shape recovery of which obviously everyone was criticizing at the at the time given the depths of the economic situation that we were we've been confronted with uh, but at the moment it continues to play out uh, in a, a very sharp recovery the question of course is how long can it be sustained when you're coming from a uh, very low base, of course. Uh, but the sub-index for new business in this service activity reading in, in China rose to 57.3, new export business gained to 52. Uh, so yeah, some, some positive signs uh, continue on that front. Uh, and this, of course, comes on the, the coattails of that forecast beating payrolls figure. Uh, it's an interesting one with payrolls because at the moment the market seems 
um, to have the appetite to just run with it and it's a positive situation however as we're you know underlying a lot of that positivity has been the fact that over that survey period it's a reflection of the economy in the US reopening so of course many more people going back into jobs but as we're seeing this week specifically is that a lot of those lockdowns are being re-implemented because of the outbreaks that we've seen in the likes of California, Florida, Texas. These very important economically because they're large populous areas of America uh, are, are winding back that reopening process. So going forward obviously it's going to be quite key then um, given this now second wave that we're seeing as to what next month's payrolls will, will kind of look like. Uh, President Trump as you can imagine, he was out immediately after payrolls. Uh, I think it was maybe Kudlow that was due to speak, uh, and then he just got bumped basically because the president wanted to come out, and he was saying that you know we've had spectacular news. It's the largest monthly jobs gain on record. The stock market's doing fantastic. The crisis is being handled. I just saw this um, overnight. He's basically done two tweets, in in caps, of course. One is law and order. And the other one is make America great again. So he is absolutely banging his PR drum at the moment. He even said as well last night that there are three vaccines that are looking great. Uh, Inovio, Pfizer, Moderna, the three that, that people are, are kind of assuming that he's talking about. So at the moment, even though he's flagging quite severely in a lot of the polls at this present point in time, um, you know, it's kind of a, a perfect timing almost for Trump going into the Independence Weekend when it's a lot about American pride and he can come into that talking about the job situation, um, talking about uh, the stock market, reflecting the fact that actually it's fake news in the media talking about the virus, which he says is about increased testing. And actually look at the stock market. The stock market is, is, is great at the minute. That's not then what the, the COVID situation would suggest. We know it's more complicated than that, but that's not the point. And that's how he wants to kind of frame the situation. And certainly for certain pockets of the, uh, the nation in America, they will be responding to that. Uh, in the way I'm sure that he's intending. So yeah, Trump continues and, and obviously we'll keep an eye out for him today uh, if he comes out with anything else and obviously we're still watching that Chinese situation. Um, yeah, the, the US COVID case nationwide increased by more than 50,000 for a second day in a row. Um, what this has led to is overnight the Texas governor Craig Abbott has issued an order requiring face masks to be worn out in public across the state. Florida, Georgia, South Carolina saw record increases on Thursday. Um, this is just having a look at Florida in particular. Uh, Miami-Dade County, uh, which I believe is the largest in Florida, is now going to impose a curfew uh, starting today from 10 p.m. local time. Um, and this, you can see here, as soon as really we, they went into that um, June period of starting. So you can see here, June 5th, most of the state entered a phase two reopening. It was really from that point onwards, and you remember seeing those photos at the time on, on various beaches in Florida where it was just absolutely packed. Um, and ever since that point, you know, cases here have, have really accelerated. Um, the interesting thing though that I have seen is that we're seeing these um, confirmed cases increase and so naturally that's leading to more hospitalizations so these two charts are, are moving higher but actual deaths due to COVID in America is still pretty flat um, now there's multiple variables that you'd need to be aware there uh, people are more um, I guess educated and aware of now the symptoms so they can act quicker the authorities have got better facilities now fixed and in place to respond to this type of thing so perhaps there's uh, a kind of a more functional part of this but at the moment yeah you know deaths are, deaths are quite flat irrespective of the fact that these cases are, are rising so maybe something to watch and in fact the seven day average of deaths nationwide in the US um, is actually at its lowest since the end of March so we're looking right back here irrespective of this development that we've seen over the last four weeks I just thought was was quite interesting does that mean though that an inevitability that at some point if the cases continue to uh, to accumulate that the death count will start rising uh, we'll see but over this weekend of course I was tweeting about this yesterday I think this weekend is going to be really important because it's Independence Day 
uh, in America and, and typically that leads to a lot of celebration um, whether it's led publicly by the state with firework displays and, and what typically would be mass gatherings or whether it's just going out and hitting the town in a normal sense uh, you know that's going to be unlikely to happen in a lot of areas because of some of the enforced rules and social distancing but it's how much and how flagrantly will those rules be broken which undoubtedly they probably will at some point um, and, and what effect is that going to have I mean in the UK of course you probably read it they're calling it super super Saturday and in America they're calling it the super spreader event in terms of Independence Day uh, and its potential but yeah in the UK I mean they're really you can see why they have to do it the hospitality sector you know has been by far the worst hit and the reality is that a lot of these because of social distancing a lot of these pubs and restaurants are just not going to be able to maintain the same level of staff because of those rules um, and so therefore a lot of people are going to lose their jobs um, so the, the, the pubs are going to come out and they're going to be you know the marketing machine is going to be in full flow and this super saturday in itself it's going to be interesting to see uh, just what reading the press on sunday how that plays out this weekend because obviously in the uk pubs are reopening restaurants hotels cinemas hairdressers so sam north you can get your hair cut uh, for the first time in about four months um, they'll be allowed to re reopen their doors basically on saturday so as i've said before going into the second half of this month it's going to be particularly interested to see how that uh, plays out for the for the UK COVID numbers uh, for sure. Um, on the Brexit side, talking of the UK, where are we at? And actually, a couple of positive noises from reading some of the articles this morning from the end of their latest round of talks. Um, the negotiators on both sides apparently have started to sketch out a broad outline of an agreement of their future relationship. They're going to regroup again in London next week. Uh, the bloc has signalled that it's prepared to back down from its demands to keep the same access to British fishing waters that it enjoys today and for the European Court of Justice to have a role in policing uh, or policing I should say any agreement so um, yeah it seems to be some political appetite and I can understand why just given the economic reality that both the uh, Eurozone and the UK are facing right now neither are going to want to unnecessarily inflict further economics um, kind of pressure on uh, what already is a uh, depressed situation on the back of a, of a health crisis um, so some compromises and, and more positive noises have been made but obviously tends to be this way in the negotiation you kind of take a few steps forward and then a step back and uh, and I think we're just in that forward phase at the moment so yeah the talks pick up back in, in in London next week and let's see how that plays out we've obviously we've gone through that that deadline about the transition request which obviously hasn't happened so now the pressure really is on to start around the middle of this month to get some sort of tentative framework agreement at least um, and then to start pushing this forward and we're still working to the assumption and timelines as a base case of something more um, concrete materializing around autumn of this year so at the moment I wouldn't take what I'm talking about here as a net positive for the pound just to dive in right now um, albeit from a technical point of view cable has now found a little bit of a, f uh, of a footing in some of the near-term price action um, you can see from the top of the range of the Asia Pacific session uh, we've broken above that and came back for us close to a retest to trade where we are at the moment so uh, if we continue to get risk general appetite and let's say the dollar just starts to fade again could well help a little bit of a push back up toward the pivot level I'm just looking at the sterling future here uh, at the moment um, but also euro dollar trapped pretty much in its near term um, kind of phase of consolidation quite a significant level there on the upside in the major pair from the overnight Asia high you can see that was in a rough area of support as well through the prior sessions uh, in Asia that we had kind of midweek. So any movement above there, that would be quite a key test and uh, around that 112, um, six, well, 112.65 kind of area. Let's have a look then at some other headlines. OPEC, what's going on here? Um, and just a few things to be aware of, uh, OPEC cut to their lowest since 1991 to shore up the oil market. Uh, this is just looking at the kind of cumulative 
OPEC crude oil production rates million barrels per day and you can see how dramatically they've dropped and which was of course their intention given that um, big volatility that we saw in oil on the onset of the pandemic and the complete kind of perception of demand destruction on the back of um, what it was going to do to just global demand for, for energy products and you know just looking at oil uh, on a on a daily continuation I mean I guess the kind of tells a bit more of a story when you look at it in, in this kind of basis. Let me just see if I can move this up so you can see the annotations. So yeah, it's interesting now where we're at. Uh, I think we are finding a bit of a natural area of, uh, I guess, fair value to a certain degree because we're trying to balance ourselves between this, which is the uh, the adherence to compliance, which has always been slightly suspect when it comes to OPEC, but they have been following through and committing at this point to that of then the balancing act of the perception of uh, not just the performance of the global economy, particularly the US uh, under this um, the situation of um, the global pandemic and the second wave and how significant that is going to be. So at the moment, you can see we're just kind of getting squeezed closer in towards and coalescing around this $40 price point, which was of course that level that we had when OPEC failed to strike that deal back in the beginning of March and we had that gap down when the price war kind of kicked off. So at the moment, um, you would feel that there is a point coming in the week or weeks ahead where we've got to kind of make our minds up here. Do we start to push back down? Um, and if so, then you know, kind of those lows that were seen in not that long ago really about a week and a half or so ago there's a pretty nice solid area of support down around the 3448 um, kind of mark which was those lows in mid-june and the high of resistance in mid to late may or do we kick on and we break above we get above that high printed on the 23rd um, and then we, we we push up and if that does happen then you know, the next big levels don't really start to kick in till the higher 40s coming up to the $50 mark. Uh, and if we continue to see a lot of this um, economic data continue to just uh, move in the way it has done, but then also this this virus in America, the outbreak we're seeing, starts to come back under a little bit of control, and then yeah, I, mean, I don't think that, that can be discounted. Uh, but again, at this point, I'd rather just see how some of these major themes evolve uh, before really committing too much, uh, at least from my, my fundamental view at this point in time. Um, let's just have a look then at another story that I thought I'd point out. This was the uh, this was talking about the Fed's balance sheet, uh, and basically as of July 1st, so two days ago, the Fed's total balance sheet size declined by 74 billion dollars to 7.06 trillion from 7.13 trillion a week earlier. And it's been led by a roughly 50 billion fall in outstanding currency swaps with foreign central banks. So if you remember um, back in March when they were announcing you know, new facilities every day, it was this global coordinated dollar swap facility that was helping then facilitate liquidity generally across the whole economic system uh, that was, was an important facility. But as I guess financial conditions have eased and um, credit has become more easily available, there's been less a necessity to tap that type of facility and so it has reduced and the balance sheet has reduced in kind because things like um, this uh, Main Street loaning, loan program which is now two weeks old, um, no one has used it yet. Uh, and this was, you know, this is very reminiscent so far and this is not to say it might not change, but it reminds me very much of when, I'm trying to remember that there's so many facilities over the years, there was one that the ECB um, put into place, which was during the sovereign crisis. So this would have been around 2011, 2012. It was a similar type of thing. It was kind of like this, a very forceful um, program that the ECB had put forward in order to safeguard what was then a sovereign crisis. And basically just by creating and putting that program there in place was enough then to pivot the general market confidence to think that well the facility's there and so how bad can it get and the market just pushed on and recovered meaning that that particular was it the omt i can't remember but the facility was never actually needed to be used at all 
So it's almost similar to this. It's like the market's so panicked when we go through these periods like we did a few weeks ago. As soon as the Fed come out and just you know over deliver massively, it's like wow, this is this is uh, phenomenal. This is unprecedented. And then actually, it gets to the point where confidence just starts to 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 surge again. Um, and then these facilities never actually need to be used. So um, that's why I think for now I'm, I'm I'm fairly comfortable with where we are in equities, despite then this pretty phenomenal recovery. I don't really see it breaking down anytime soon because even if it did, and and things get worse in whatever shape that might take, whether COVID or whether trade war risk, at the end of the day, these these um, facilities from the Fed have hardly been touched at all. So. Uh, there's definitely scope there for the Fed to to be the buyer of last resort in that respect, which has always been the the kind of you know the the mantra of don't fight the Fed, and, uh, and it kind of remains true to a certain extent at this point. So, final thing, the calendar for today, there really is nothing happening. Uh, we have some service PMI numbers, but these are final readings. Uh, so, I mean, that is it really. So, I would try to remain patient. I would try to remain disciplined and not get too ahead of yourselves on a day like today. Uh, play the market, I'd say, uh, probably more from a technical point of view with the lack of distinct fundamental catalysts. Um, usual themes are in play. Uh, and actually, just one last chart I wanted to just bring in uh, that I forgot to mention earlier, but I just wanted to, to show you. Uh, this this was looking at the, uh, the yellow line is the S&P 500, and the purple line is the city surprise index and you remember i was saying that 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 citigroup surprise index how much us data is outperforming the actual median expectation has been at record highs and obviously we saw this again with payrolls last night or yesterday um, but what was quite interesting is when we were going through april may as that surprise index started to outperform the equity market also started to move up but you can see here as we've gone through mid-june the city surprise index has continued to surprise but the equity market has become increasingly unresponsive and I thought that was quite interesting it's almost like now it's almost expected that data is going to outperform and so it's rendering that surprise index quite redundant in that respect and um, I thought it was just an interesting observation that you, know, you shouldn't be I don't think it's quite as clear now to just say yeah good data market goes up anymore because the market's now reflecting a lot of that, and hence the, the phenomenal recovery that we've had over the last couple of months. All right, that is it. So again, have a wonderful weekend. If you're in America, happy Independence Day for tomorrow. If you're in the UK, uh, enjoy sensibly Super Saturday, and I'll see you back here uh, same time as usual on Monday morning. Thanks very much, guys. Take care.